Right. Oh. Uh, good morning. Good morning. Good morning. There we go. Hey. Hey. Is there anyone here from Finland? Yay. Is there anyone here from Wales? OK. Me. Hey, me. <laughs> me. Yeah. There. Really? Oh, brilliant. Aberystwyth. Always raining. Yeah. Unlike, unlike Wales, which is kind of not always raining, but usually raining. Usually raining. So actually, the weather in Wales is much, much worse at the moment than it is here. You've got like really good weather. So I, I, maybe we should do a sort of a, a weather exchange program for a bit. Um, right, well, I've got, I got 45 minutes to talk about me, basically, which is, of course, wonderful for all authors because we love to talk about me. Um, uh, not me like Jasper Ford, me as in oneself. Um, and, of course, talking about our books. Uh, and, of course, asking an author to talk about their books is like um, asking parents to talk about their children, you know, which you should never do because they won't stop. Um, it, it always amuses me about <coughs> listening to people talking about their children is that they think they have the most beautiful, most intelligent, wonderful, unique child of all, when of course they're entirely wrong because I do. <laughs> so um, just to put all you parents straight, you know, may seem wonderful, but actually you haven't seen my children because they are perfect. Um, I, I, I labelled this talk um, from zero to New York Times bestseller in a third of a billion seconds um, to give you an idea about how long this took and how long the writer's journey can be. Some authors manage to get their first book published and it becomes a runaway bestseller and fame and fortune follows swiftly upon them. Um, I hate those people. Um, I don't really, I don't hate anyone, except maybe Nigel Farage <laughs> uh, and Boris Johnson. I, th I think I hate them. Do you know, Boris Johnson, um, he, he, he is hated by so many people that even Boris Johnson has noticed. <laughs> you know, that's how much he is hated. And because um, Nigel Farage doesn't know, you see, he, he is so stupid, he cannot know that he is hated so much. But Boris Johnson knows that he's hated, and, and I think that gives him just a little bit, you know, a little bit, maybe he's not quite as bad uh, as we think he is. Anyway, but that's enough about the, the EU. Um, we have to stop eating foreign food now in the UK. Um, so basically, it's beans on toast and roast beef if we're lucky. But we do have puddings. We have very good puddings. I think that all food can be improved either with uh, bacon, added bacon, because even bacon is improved with bacon, because then you've got m more bacon, uh, and there's n nothing wrong with having more bacon. Um, and of course, puddings are always improved by more custard, um, especially custard, because then you have more custard, obviously. Um, so what I'm going to talk about is, is about writing. Um, for me, it was a long journey. I started writing when I was actually quite old. I was 27 when I started writing. The reason for this, because uh, I, I spent 20 years in the film industry, uh, and everybody thinks that I was clearly a writer in the film industry, that I wrote film scripts, that I did things like that. I wasn't. I was actually uh, a technical person. I was a camera, a cam assistant camera. First AC, they call them in the States, um, or focus puller. They call, them, um, they call them in the UK. So my skill set is essentially being able to guess distances. Right, so, so uh, to you two there, I can pretty much say with a reasonable rep, accuracy is about sort of 16 foot 8, 17 foot, about that, which is very useful if I want to have a career in selling carpets. <laughs> but it doesn't help very much writing books. I think the reason I moved into writing books is because I, I had an overwhelming love of story ever since I was very, very small. Story for me has always been very, very exciting, uh, whether that was actually in books or on the TV, in movies, in theater, in jokes, uh, in uh, imaginative play, because when we're children, if you can remember that far back, or if you are a child, yesterday, 
um, that you used to have games. Do you remember that? You used to, used to sort of make up a game that you used to go and play. And um, my own children, I have, I have quite a few children, my own children say, you know, like, Dad, I'm bored, can we watch the TV? Uh, and I go, no, you cannot, because I am Victorian father. And uh, you shall be bored, because being bored is an essential part of growing up and being a child. Because when you're bored, you find something to do. When you're bored, you shouldn't actually go and stare at a glowing oblong. You should actually go out and make a, make a game. And I, I often add that onto the list. And the reason I do add it onto the list of inspirations is because I think people do not understand how important imaginative play is to the childish mind. And everything that's important to you in your childish mind is important to you in your adult mind. So all you people who may be parents or will become parents or know someone who are parents, if your child says, I'm bored, do not give them your iPhone. Tell them to go outside and make up a game. Usually, when my children are playing, I listen in, I want to see, because you remember when you used to play these games, you used to, set, you used to make out the ground rules. The, you make up the rules of the scenario of the game that you're going to play. And I listen to my children, and they say, right, OK, we're going to play this game. They've got their friends around, so there's four of them. And they say, right, our parents are dead. <laughs> and you go, oh, OK. And we have to look after ourselves, you know. And the smallest one is always the baby that has to be looked after. Uh, which the smallest one loves, of course. But you, you kind of have basically the, the plot of The Walking Dead uh, <laughs> straight away, this sense of survival against insuperable odds. Because when you're a child, of course, you know, the whole orphan thing is, is a very big deal. Um, so very important, imaginative play. I used to do a lot of that when I was a kid, and I think it's, um, it's inspired my writing as much as, as anything else. Um, so I, was, I, I started off um, being incredibly bad at school. Uh, I was hopeless at school, very, very bad academic. My family was very academic. All my brothers and sisters, I have two, two elder brothers and a younger sister, uh, and they all have doct they're all doctors of something, right? Not medicine, which would be useful, um, <laughs> but they are doctors of economics and history and archaeology. Uh, and my father was a, a doctor of economics as well. Um, so growing up with a very academic family, you tend to think of writing as something that only clever people can do. Right? I did not see myself as a clever person. I saw myself as a bit thick, to be honest, um, because I was so useless at school. This is entirely wrong, of course, and we know that now, but 30 years ago, if you weren't good at school, you'll ne you'd never be good at anything, to be honest. So, I basically did what I wanted to do, which was work in the film industry. Always wanted to do it from the age of 10 onwards. As soon as I noticed that films were made, because I saw a documentary which was like the making of, which was quite rare in those days, I, I realized that that's what I wanted to do because of the sense of making something out of nothing, this smoke and mirrors, this pretend world, this, uh, this sort of magical kingdom where you, can, you have something that looks like rock on one side, and on the other, it's just plaster and a bit of two by two. That sense of magic you know, really, really attracted me to the film industry. So at about the age of 19, I didn't go to university. I couldn't go to university with the grades that I had. Um, I don't know whether you have the equivalent of an A-level. That's what you, the equivalent of A-levels, do you? Yeah, yeah. I, I had a grade, a grade D in art. That was the sum total of my last two years of education. Gave me a great D in art. Um, it cost my father a huge amount of money. I was at private education. That must have been the most expensive D in the whole of uh, education. Um, so I started working in the film industry. Uh, I started off as a runner. I was making uh, tea and coffee and doing photocopying. My first celebrity coffee that I made was for Angela Lansbury. Thank you, thank you. I accept your adulation. <laughs> Thank you. Um, yeah, you know, uh, here's your coffee, you know, Miss Lansbury, like that, you know. Um, and she was so lovely and so wonderful, as you imagine her to be. She's like the perfect granny, you know. She's just fantastic. Um, 
Anyway, so I, I started working on there. I worked a bit in the editing rooms, and then I started working as a camera trainee. But all the time, I was kind of thinking that I'm helping other people tell their stories. And what I really want to do is I want to kind of tell my own stories. And anyone who works in the film industry wants to be a film director, except the film directors, right? And then sort of film director, they want to be Kubrick, you know. Um, so I was kind of thinking, well, how can I make my own films? Because at the time, it was very expensive to make films because you had to use the whole film thing and you had to have it processed and you couldn't even tele-cine it. There was no, editing was still done by chopping up bits of celluloid. Yes, I know, extraordinary, it's true. That's how they used to um, edit films together. Um, so I so thought, well, you know, I, I started shooting a bit of film, and it, it was pretty awful. I remember I did a, a film about someone being attacked by a garden gnome, uh, which I thought was quite amusing. I've still got it somewhere, in black and white, you know, on 16 mil. Um, and then I remember listening to um, a talk given by uh, Bob Zemeckis, you know, Robert Zemeckis, who did uh, the Back to the Future series. And, and he said... Um, he was being interviewed for a film called Death Becomes Her. Do you remember that? With Meryl Streep, with the head on backwards. Terrible movie, but it was very early kind of, um, you know, CGI. Um, and he said you could always write your way into the film industry, right? You can write your way into the film industry. And this is absolutely true, because there are very few really good film scripts. You only have to go out there and watch a movie to realise how true this is, you know, most films are pretty awful, and uh, it's basically down to the script. So it's fun to, that's, that's the building block of any, of any movie is, of course, the script. So I thought, okay, well, this is a good idea. Why don't I start writing a really good, and I mean really good, not just one that my mum thinks is good, <laughs> film script? And then, of course, you know, I'll take it to, to a producer, and they'll go, Okay, Ford, this movie script is so good, we've got to make it. There is no, there is no way we cannot make this movie because this film script is so brilliant, like that. So I thought, okay, well, that's what I do. So I started writing this um, film script, da -da 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 and it was actually on a typewriter. You know, this is how old I am. You know, I'm very well preserved. It's, it's clearly all those children and, you know, clean living. Um, and I started writing this film script, and, and it was terrible really. It was awful. Um, and I think that was quite an interesting point for me, because if you do something and you know it's terrible, right, um, in most walks of life, this might be, you know, rather, you know, difficult for you. In writing, it's really good, right? If you have a small sense of self-loathing, right, very useful if, you're, if you want to get anywhere in the creative endeavors world. Because if you write something and you think, Brilliant. I don't need to change a word. It's probably shit. <laughs> and if you can't see that it's shit, then that's a big problem. But if you can look at your own work and say, this is appalling and you're truly the worst writer in the history of anything, then yes, you absolutely have a chance to be a good author. Because self-criticism is vital. Because no matter how many times you give your script to someone to read, they will only be interested in it once. If you give it to someone to read again, they'll go, yeah, yeah, whatever, Jasper, they're bored already. So you're, you're your own critic, and that's very, very important, self-criticism. So I wrote this film script, and it was truly awful, and I thought, okay, it's not working, I'll try and rewrite it. It was still awful. I, I tried to write another one. It was terrible, right? I kept on writing these awful, awful scripts. The ideas were kind of okay, but everything else just awful. Then I heard somebody else say, this was Graham Greene, the, uh, the, um, the novelist, obviously, uh, not my dentist, who is also called Graham Greene, um, rather oddly, weird, weirdly. You know, if your name was Green, would you really call your child Graham? <laughs> anyway, I don't know. Anyway, Graham Greene. Um, but my, my next door neighbor was called um, uh, Dr. Dr. Tooth, right? But, but he, wa <laughs> he wasn't a dentist. <laughs> so Graham Greene, who wasn't a writer, was my dentist, and Dr. Tooth, who wasn't a dentist was my next door neighbor and was a writer. But when you met Mr. and Mrs. Tooth together, they were known as the teeth. <laughs> it's good, isn't it? Um, anyway, so Graham Greene, who wrote, the, um, who wrote the, the film script to The Third Man, 
right? Has anyone seen The Third Man, the film? Yeah, great movie, right? If anyone in here is, wants to be a uh, storyteller or a movie maker or anything, or you just want to see a good movie, go and see The Third Man. It's got a perfect, it's, it's, it's as close to being a perfect film as I think you can be. Um, Chinatown is another one. Uh, Harvey is another one that I think are almost perfect movies, script-wise, acting-wise, direction, everything. It just works 100%. And he said, uh, Graham Greene, he said that what he used to do was to write a treatment to the film that he was going to write. So The Third Man, the book, was actually a treatment for The Third Man, the, the script, right, the film. So I thought, well, if it's good enough for Graham Greene, it's, it's certainly good enough for me. So I thought, why don't I start writing a short story so I can get all the characters? This was the theory, you see, is you get all the characters, you get all the characters and the situations and the atmosphere and the pace, you make that work as a short story, and then you turn it into a script, and you can show the short story to the director and say, well, this is kind of how I want it to look. So I started writing a short story, which I would then turn into a screenplay. So I wrote my first short story on a typewriter in 1988, when I was 27, two months before my daughters were born. Um, I never wrote another film script. I realized, writing that short story, is that I'd sort of come home, or I'd found my home, or I'd, I'd arrived somewhere. And I was going, it was still wasn't very good, but I was going, do you know what? I, I, I think I can do this. And do you know what? I think I'm really enjoying this because I don't need a camera. I don't need an editor. I don't need film. I don't need actors. I don't need someone to build the set. I can do all of it myself. And I don't need a budget. <laughs> if I want to have 28 camels on Mars, I can. You know, because if you, if you showed that script to a, a producer, they'd go, well, I'm not sure about this 28 camels thing, and, and really shooting on Mars is way over our budget, you know. Uh, so there was this wonderful freedom, I think, to discovering this sense of not only writing is wonderful and great fun, but that I could sort of think that I might be able to do it in the future. So I carried on writing short stories. I did one, I did another, I did another after that. Um, and whenever I wrote a short story, the way in which I approached the short story was by something I called the narrative dare. The narrative dare. This is um, a theory that is, I think, mine. Um, and if you are an author, I would recommend that you attempt this idea. The narrative dare is very simple. You give yourself a narrative dare. You say, okay, there's a gorilla stuck up a tree in the garden of somebody's house in Surrey. Explain. And then you have to explain exactly why the gorilla is up a tree. But you have to explain it in the arc of a story. It has to have a sort of beginning. It has to have a kind of middle. It has to have a kind of payoff, and it has to have a little end as well. It has to work. It has to function as a story in the traditional sense of a story. Uh, and that's what I did for the next 12 years, essentially. The narrative dares got harder. That's the wonderful thing about narrative dares. Firstly, you can't let yourself off the dare. Do you remember what a dare was when you were kids? You know, it's can you jump off the, like, fifth step? Do you remember playing that game? Do you ever play that game in Finland when you were kids? And you go, you jump off the second step, and then some other kid jumps off the third step, and then you jump off the fourth step, and then the fifth step. And then there was always some kid who didn't really understand, and they tried to jump off the seventh step, and they ended up on their nose, and then you all got into trouble. It's, you, you ever have that? Yeah? It was like when you were off going stealing apples, there was always some kid who was with you who was slower and got caught, and you kind of felt kind of guilty about it. You know, that kind of... Anyway. Um, the thing about a dare is you can't let yourself off the hook. You, you have to do the dare. And if you challenge yourself to harder and harder narrative dares, you have to use more and more and greater and greater ingenuity to be able to tell the really stupid story you're trying to tell. 
Because silly is good, but stupid is bad, right? A stupid story is not a good story. A silly story can be a very good story indeed. I often, with my writing, sort of teeter on the edge between silly and stupid. But I, I remember challenging myself once to do a narrative dare about someone who turns into a banana. Um, now, that's a very difficult story to tell, because if you tell a story about someone turning into a banana, it is kind of stupid. You have to somehow disguise it as something else. You have to use a bit of subterfuge, a bit of misdirection, if you like. And I remember writing this story, and it turned out as a sort of rather sort of gothic horror story in which bananas were never mentioned. Um, although I described how the transformation, I actually never mentioned bananas. And, and the theory behind this was that you would read this story and you would read my other books, which were pretty silly, and you'll think, well, I wonder what was going on with that whole, you know, gothic sort of, and that weird transformation. And then you'd go, ah, oh, of course it was a banana. <laughs> but you see, as long as you didn't think about it, when you were reading the story, I've won, right? I've won. I have it. Because you've been bananaed by stealth. <laughs> and I think that's, it teaches you and it certainly teach, taught me, when I was learning to write, that there are all sorts of ways in which you can tell stories. You can put the audience in front of you for a bit, your readers in front of you, you can put them slightly behind you, you can be with them at the same time, uh, and you can misdirect people in wonderfully uh, fun and interesting ways. So this is, I was writing short stories. Um, one of my short stories, uh, where, the, where the narrative dare was, um, Humpty Dumpty uh, was murdered. Do you have Humpty Dumpty here in Finland? Or you know what it is? Humpty Dumpty sat on a wall. Humpty Dumpty had a great fall. All the king's horses, all the king's men couldn't pump it together again. Okay. It's actually, a, we think it's a riddle, although no one really knows the, 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 the origins of it. Uh, it's a riddle of which the answer is uh, an egg. Um, and I thought, okay, let's treat Humpty Dumpty as a murder mystery, a police procedural. You know, how would that work? And of course, the way in which narrative dares work is that you have to use a bit of misdirection because Humpty Dumpty is a very large egg with arms and legs and can talk, you know. They don't really exist in our world. Or if they do, I've never seen one. So you have to make the world slightly off kilter to make the action work. And I sort of fell into this through this whole notion of narrative dares and everything else I'd been working on. And this short story got longer and longer and longer until it was 100,000 words and I'd written my first novel, right? And this was in about 1993, about 1993. Um, and because I was so proud of my first novel and the fact that I managed to do it, uh, finishing novel is a, is a great skill in itself, is a very difficult skill. Um, and it's a skill that you, no matter how many books you write, only ever increases by one each time. So the skill of finishing a book, I've actually only done 12 times, you know, which really is not very, you know, there's not a lot of experience in finishing books. Um, but I had finished this one, and of course I was so proud of it that I very swiftly sent it off to all the publishers and agents I could think of, right? Because I knew I knew that I would have basically them knocking on my door, you know, all, all the great, you know, Penguin, Hodder, um, Random House, you know, all those big companies um, would be, you know, literally, you know, beating a path to my door. And I kind of thought that. I really did genuinely believe that. Um, the amount of um, offers I had were a nice round number. Um, nothing the roundest number you can get. Uh, they didn't actually even want to read the rest. <laughs> I sent them the opening chapter, you know, and I, I had a byline was, um, it's Inspector Morse meets Mother Goose, you know. Um, looking back on it now, I should have put Da Vinci in the title. Um, did Da Vinci kill Humpty Dumpty, you know, and it, that would have been, that would have sold straight away. Because at the time, anything with Da Vinci in the title was, was selling really well. As, you know, 20 years later, anything with, you know, Fifty Shades of, um, you know, sold fantastically well, you know. Fifty Shades of Lecturn, you know, would have just sold gazillions. 
Um, and this was, very, uh, this was kind of interesting for me and a little bit disappointing because essentially um, somebody was insulting my child, um, you know, because as I said, books are like children. Um, and the, the sort of mischievous part in me, you know, whenever someone shows me their baby, you know, and they say, you know, this is my, my baby, I always want to say something like, oh, yeah, a bit ugly, isn't it? <laughs> you know, things you can't say. And they went, what do you mean ugly? I say, well, you know, ugly as in not very attractive, you know, not very, not very human-like, you know, a bit sort of, you know. I'm... But unfortunately, that's what people are saying to you when they say, we don't want to publish your book, is that we don't like it. They don't give you any advice. You never get any advice from rejections, because if they gave you advice, you might take the advice and then expect it to be published. And we're going back to 1993 now, so we're very much still in the traditional um, publishing model. Um, but, and this is why the second skill comes in, first of all, thinking that your writing is a bit rubbish, that's skill number one. Skill number two is never give up. Never give up. If somebody says it's rubbish, stop writing, you'll never be a writer, you're completely hopeless, Jasper, just ignore them, right? Because I was having fun. I was enjoying myself, and I felt that, oddly enough, that I wasn't there yet. And this is the important thing about writing. If you've written one book, you're just learning your craft, okay? It's that simple. You are learning a skill, like any other skill that you may have to learn. These things take years. You didn't learn to talk or read or write overnight. You had to learn these skills. So um, I, was, I said to myself, no surrender. I'm having a lot of fun here. So I'm going to write a sequel to a book I cannot get published. <laughs> so you can see that my strategy was not, you know, it, it finally honed at this point. But I thought, well, it is fun. And I think the whole idea of telling nursery rhymes as police procedurals actually do, does have a lot of legs to it. So I chose another um, nursery rhyme or nursery story um, of the three bears. Three bears, Goldilocks, perfect, police procedural. Goldilocks is a journalist, turns up dead in Somme World, which was a, a First World War theme park that is next to the forest in which the three bears live. Right, that's not in the original story. I, I made that bit up. Um, and then, of course, I could... Um, the wonderful thing about the three bears is it's a story that is riddled with inconsistencies, for a start. Um, first of all, why were Mummy Bear and Daddy Bear sleeping in, the, um, sleeping in separate beds? OK? They're sleeping in separate beds, I think, because there's some marital discord within the bear family unit. You know, there's some problems there in the bear marriage. Um, secondly, if you think about the porridge... Daddy Bear's porridge, big bowl, too hot. Yeah? Mummy Bowl's porridge, medium size, too cold. Baby Bear's bowl, small, just right. Okay, from a thermodynamic point of view, <laughs> this doesn't stack up at all. Right. So when they left to go and do what bears do in the woods in the morning, and they left the bowls, somebody must have come in after they left and before Goldilocks arrived, there had to be a fourth bear somewhere in the story because the, the problem with the bear's marriage and the problem with the porridge. And I thought, okay. So in that entire book, the narrative dare was explain the porridge temperature differential. <laughs> right? That took me about 70,000 words to do that. You know, but it does explain it about two-thirds of the way through the book. But there's lots of other stuff going on, so you know, we, we, we have some other stuff to deal with. Um, and I, I, th I thought this really worked. And oddly enough, retelling nursery rhymes and nursery stories clearly does work because a lot of, you've seen all the movies and everything going on, and there is also now a kind of sub-genre, if you like, about retelling uh, nursery stories. So clearly this was something that, that people did want to read. This book was rejected as well. Uh, no one was interested in um, knowing about the three bears and Goldilocks. Uh, it was called The Fourth Bear. It still is. And it was the second book I wrote. This was about 1994 now. Um, now, this was an interesting sort of point for me because I suddenly realized when I was writing these books and they weren't being published that it was possible I'd never be published because these two were my straight 
normal books. As far as I'm concerned, there was nothing unusual about these at all, although at the time, no one was really doing that. So I thought, OK, so I've got, got, got some choices here. So I could either stop writing right, and concentrate on my other career, which was in the film business, being a cameraman eventually, hopefully. I could either give up. I could either do the only piece of advice I ever got when I was learning to be a writer, and that was, uh, if you want to be published, look at what's being published and write something similar. Right, that was the only piece of advice that I ever got, right, which is the worst piece of advice, because you could spend a year writing a book that wasn't your own, and if it didn't get published, then what a waste of a year, because not only have you not got a pu book published, it's not even yours. It's a copy of someone else's. So I wasn't going to do that. And the third choice, really, was carry on writing. And I thought, well, I'll carry on writing. But, and this is, I think, what's important, is that it didn't matter what I wrote. Because I was writing for myself. Because the feeling was that, well, I'm not going to be published. So I started writing my third book with a narrative dare, um, Jane Eyre is kidnapped out of Jane Eyre, and somebody has to get her back, which eventually became a book called The Air Affair. Um, with this, I could use all the skills that I'd, um, I'd, uh, I'd learned from the previous two books, because if you have a very silly idea, and essentially Jane Eyre can't be kidnapped out of Jane Eyre, because, well, it's a character in a book in our real world, just being, just being sort of, you know, rather prosaic here for a moment, but the way in, w way in which you can hide silly ideas is the same way as you can hide a stick. And the best place to hide a stick, you'd know here in Finland, the best place to hide a stick is, of course, in the forest. No one will ever find a stick in the forest, ever. You'd never know which one it was. And the best place to hide a silly idea, of course, is in a sea of other silly ideas. So the idea about Jane Eyre being kidnapped over Jane Eyre doesn't become abnormal at all. Because in the book of the Eyre Affair, I have science fiction, I have werewolves, I have time travel, everything. Um, uh, um, Wales is a socialist republic. I've got uh, alternative history, alternative technology. I've got genetic, uh, a genetic revolution that never happened. All sorts of things going on in this book to disguise the fact that it's a kind of impossible, weird, wonderful world. So I started writing this, and it was kind of not going to be, clearly not going to be published because it was too weird. Um, I, I, I sent that to a couple of people when I finished it. I finished it in about 95, I think. It took me a couple of years to write. It was quite a big, a big, a, a big write. A uh, couple, of, couple, of, couple, of, couple of years. Um, that didn't sell either. So I wrote another book about a dragon. The Last Dragon, in fact. It was called The Last Dragon Slayer. I tried to get that published. That didn't work either. I wrote a book called um, It Was a Dark and Stormy Night. You know, terrible title. If there was a sequel, it would be called And So the Long Evening Wore On. <laughs> that was not published either. Still not published, actually. It's still sitting on my hard drive. And I was just writing another one called Long Division about um, somebody who, who separates like an amoeba. Uh, which is kind of weird, I think. But I discovered later on that I think it's been done already. And I was halfway through that when somebody suddenly said, uh, right, Jasper, this Air Affair book you've written, because what I used to do is I used to write a book, and I used to try and get it published. And rather than spending hours and months and years trudging around and trying to convince people to buy it, I wanted to sell it on its own merits. You can still, I mean, going back to what Bob Zemeckis say about you can always write your way into the film industry, you can write your way into the publishing industry. In fact, it's the only way to get into the publishing industry. It's, like, it's the only way to get into an orchestra or a jazz band. You play your way in. If you're an artist, you paint your way into that. If you're a sculptor, you sculpt your way into um, any field of endeavor, essentially, you get there by doing it and doing it well or differently from someone else. So, you know, if, you know, an approach to an agent, you know, someone says, how do I, you know, how do I get my book published? And I say, well, um, it, make it good. It's probably the best answer. 
Um, write better books is the answer to every single question you can ask yourself in publishing, right? How do I increase sales? Write better books. Um, how, how can I, you know, get a better publisher? But write better books. How do I make more money? Uh, write better books. How do I win awards? Write better books. You know, it's really basically the answer. Um, so what I used to do is instead of you know hawking my books around, you know, like a brush salesman, I used to just send them in um, to as many people as I could think of, uh, and then when they rejected it, just carry on writing, because I thought that if I'm going to spend six months doing anything, rather than trying to sell, them, <laughs> rather than sell the book, I'll just write another book, and that's actually probably a better way of of trying to get published. Anyway, so I'd, I'd try and get them, I'd write a book, try and get it sold. If it didn't sell, then I'd rewrite the other book. So all these books are being rewritten as I kept on going. So, so the, uh, the fourth bear, I'd rewrite it, you know, after I'd finished uh, The Air Affair, the first draft of The Air Affair. And then I'd go back to The Air Affair after I'd finished The Last Dragon Slayer. And after I'd finished that, then I'd go up to my long division. And then I'd, I'd keep on going and all the time rewrite them and then send them off again, right? Um, and quite by chance, somebody picked up on the air affair, and they said, uh, OK, uh, Jasper, I've read this. This was my agent. Her name was uh, Tiff at the time. I mean, her name, was, she didn't change her name. Uh, she's just no longer my agent. Um, and she said, uh, yeah, this kind of can work, I think, the air affair, because it's a sort of strange book that's flying off in all directions, and it's uh, imaginative, firing off in a sort of fizzy, fizz of imagination. And she said, uh, c c will you leave it with me and I'll see if I can place it with a, with a publisher. And I went, well, listen, just have it. You know, because no one else has, you're the first person to ever read it in the industry, which is true, she was. And this is 1999 now. So I've, I've spent um, nearly 12 years trying to write. And this is the first time anyone's actually shown any interest. And um, she said, okay. And she went away and two weeks later, she had it placed at Hodder in London. And six weeks after that, she got me a deal with Penguin in the US. Um, and strangely enough, it actually went into the New York Times bestseller list um, when it was published in the US. And I was there, actually, at, at, at um, Penguin when, when, it, when the news came through. I think it made number seven or something like that, maybe five or seven or something like that. And they were all jumping around and doing high fives and punching the air. And I was going, oh, jolly good. Like this. <laughs> And they go, no, 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 you don't understand. And I go, I do understand. Inside, I'm running around screaming. Um, but outside, I'm just being British. And I go, oh, marvelous, marvelous, you know, like this. Um, but I think what happened, and this is perhaps, you know, the interesting part of it, is that the, the weakness became the strength. Uh, and the weakness of my writing was that I was specifically wanting to write what I wanted to write. I wasn't going to write Me Too books. I had silly ideas, and I thought, I think these can work. And I was willing to spend days, hours, weeks, months, years, if necessary, working on these silly ideas that I think, you know, could have sold. So kind of the message, really, to anyone who is, wants to be an author is even if you have the bizarrest idea imaginable, if you like it, write it. Don't worry about the market. Don't worry about anything like that. Because when I was published in, well, when they picked up the book in 1990, no, 2000, in 2000, I was published in 2001. If you go back to the decade before, it was all kind of lad lit and chick lit. And that's what, that's what publishers were sort of publishing. And that's certainly what people like Hodder were publishing. So the idea of mixing Jane Eyre with time travel and werewolves was kind of unusual and different. And nobody thought that this was a sort of book that was going to be published. And it was a sort of surprise you know, publishing idea, which kind, of, which kind of worked. So never give up. No surrender. And always remember that 10 years spent writing is actually 10 years learning your craft. All those rejections were not them saying, you know, basically, piss off, Jasper. We don't like you. You're complete rubbish. You'll never be any good. And you should do something else. It was basically them saying to me, it's not good enough yet. And the yet is the word that you have to remember when you're a writer trying to be a writer. It's not good enough yet. But it will be, given time, effort, energy, and concentration. Um, that's 
really how I got to be uh, a writer in a third of a billion seconds. Um, in, in only, telling you in only 45 minutes. We do have like three or four minutes left, so if there are any questions, I would be more than happy to answer them. Oh, go on, go on, be daring, ask a question. It can be anything, but not about um, um, sport, because I'm, I'm very bad at sport. You can ask me about the EU. I don't know. Anyway, yes. And I'll, I'll, if you say it, I'll hear it, and I'll, I'll say it back. Right, so what, what you're saying is that um, uh, instead of rewriting the same script to actually go on to something else, would I recommend that? Yes, I would. I would definitely recommend that. Um, you write one book, you rewrite it, it might be rejected. I would say, move on to something else. Right. I mean, if you were a paint... Oh, God, these get in the way. It, it's like I, I want to have a digger, you know, <laughs> like being in a tank or something. Um, yeah, I mean, if you were a painter, you wouldn't f spend three years working on the same canvas, although you might. You would be sketching endlessly, and then you and then you sketch again. And, and that, that's, that's what I think you should do. And, and don't just do novels. You could do short stories. Keep a diary. Journal, very important. I've kept a, I've kept a daily diary now for 22 years. It's three and a half million words. Most of it, worthless. But expressing yourself in as few words as possible without any editing, very valuable. So I would suggest, yeah, work on a novel, set it aside, work on another novel, and then you go, ah, I've learned something writing this novel that will make that novel better. I'll go back to that novel. Yeah, that's a bit better. Right now, oh, that one's terrible. But I've learned some things rewriting that one that's going to make this one better. And I write that, still not very good, I'll write this one. Ah, I've learned something there that's going to make that and that better. Because it's a skill set. You're learning skills. And everything you do then can improve those skills. And if you're also doing a diary, poetry, a few short stories every now and again, then all that helps. So it all helps. Yeah. Yes? Right, so this was about what the actual writing process. Did I write in you know, at the weekends? Did I do a hit bit here, a bit there? Um, I, I, was, I was working at the same time, but I was very fortunate because the most expensive commodity in writing, like any creative endeavor, the, most, the, the thing that costs the most money, time, right? Computers, dead cheap. Pencil, doesn't cost you anything. Time is expensive. If you don't have time, then you have to somehow buy it from yourself. And that's very, very difficult, because if you don't work, then of course it's going to cost you a great deal of, uh, of money. Um, I was fortunate in that I was working in the film industry, which is a freelance world, and I managed to figure out that if I only did like two and a half days a week, on average, throughout the year, I could still afford to live and feed my children. So that's what I did. I did less work. So my, I let my career in the film industry sort of take a bit of a back seat, although I kept it going, so then I'd have time to write. So what I used to do is I used to do a big movie, say like Mask of Zorro or Goldeneye or something like that, and then I used to have two, two months off until the commercials work started picking up, and then I had two months to write. But I used to write in the evenings and whenever I could. So instead of you know going down to the pub and talking nonsense to friends, I, I, I was working, I was writing. I was trying to teach myself to write. Um, you can think about it a lot, and I do think you know, it's, it's important to think about writing, but there is no alternative to actually getting down to it on the coal face, as I call it, and write. You know, inspiration, yeah, very important. Perspiration, doubly important. All books, they say, 90% perspiration, 10% inspiration. It, it's, it's no good hoping that inspiration will suddenly strike and then and the book will be done. You've 
got to get down and write it. And it's only, I think, when you're writing it do, does it all things suddenly start dropping into place. Yeah. Um, right, I think we've got time for maybe one more question. Yes? My, the favourite book of my books? Um, I think the f my favourite book is probably The Fourth Bear um, because it has a sort of... There is a kind of nonsense, a tradition of nonsense in the British storytelling tradition that I felt The Fourth Bear did have a lot of nonsense, really good quality, silly nonsense in it. You know, talking bears, the whole right to arm bears uh, controversy, all kinds of great silly ideas. Um, but the, work, the, work, the book I'm most proud of is a science fiction book I wrote called uh, Shades of Grey, uh, because it's like, I always felt it's a, a real novel because it's all my own characters. Because all my previous books, all the Thursday Next series about you know, the Jane Eyre thing and the, and the nursery crime are all characters that are already there. But when I wrote um, Shades of Grey, it was about my own characters in my own situations. And that's probably the book I'm, I'm most proud of. But anyway, um, right, I think we're out of time now. Thank you very much indeed uh, for listening. I hope it's been fun and have a great conference. Thank you. Thank you.